Hello, my name is Ben Coons, and uh, this is going to be a talk on acetabular and femoral osteotomies in the setting of hip dysplasia. So uh, in this talk, we'll go over the definition of hip dysplasia. We'll explain why it's important. Uh, we're going to talk about different treatment options as well as uh, clinical uh, ways to, ident uh, to identify this patient population. So for hip dysplasia, uh, it is a oftentimes a radiographic diagnosis uh, we define as a shallow acetabular socket. On uh, the above uh, x-ray, uh, this is a patient that has hip dysplasia. You can compare it to the below, um, the x-ray below showing a patient that has normal acetabular coverage. And uh, it should be clear that the x-ray of the patient uh, on top has uh, decreased uh, bony coverage of the femoral head compared to the patient below. Uh, importantly, uh, adult hip dysplasia is distinct from congenital or developmental dysplasia of the hip. Uh, oftentimes, uh, DDH or congenital dysplasia is diagnosed uh, at birth or in early childhood. Uh, this is uh, um, a talk that's going to focus on the treatment of, dipla uh, of dysplasia in the adult setting. Uh, it could be residual developmental dysplasia from the of the hip that was missed uh, early on in childhood, or it could be a result of other factors, uh, including failure of secondary ossification or possibly i iatrogenic uh, hip dysplasia. Dysplasia is important because there's a strong association with the uh, development of osteoarthritis, and it's not the eventual development of osteoarthritis, but the early development of osteoarthritis. This was data from a uh, study almost 50 years ago uh, showing the predilection for patients that have dysplasia uh, to uh, eventually end up uh, getting end-stage uh, uh, hip uh, osteoarthritis and ult uh, ultimately needing uh, total hip arthroplasty. Uh, this was a more recent study showing the natural history of hip dysplasia in patients that had an arthroplasty on the contralateral hip. You can see that the dysplastic population uh, outlined in the Kaplan-Meier graph uh, has a much lower survival percentage compared to patients with femoroacetabular impingement or normal acetabular morphology. Uh, further, in a uh, earlier study by Dr. Gans, uh, they found that in their series, no patient uh, that had severe hip dysplasia had a well-functioning hip at 65, which I think goes to show that patients um, that have radiographic hip dysplasia are certainly at higher risk for having hip problems uh, later on in life, uh, particularly in their you know 40s and 50s, which are, would still consider their very active years. So hip dysplasia uh, is known to cause arthritis and from a biomechanical standpoint, uh, it can be explained by uh, putting increased stress on the smaller uh, area of acetabular cartilage uh, that the femoral head is going to be exposed to. Uh, so that graphically, graphically can be represented here with the graphic on the left showing normal acetabular coverage and the, the joint forces that the acetabular cartilage sees. Uh, compared to the dysplastic, you can see a concentration of force that results in the cartilage seeing an abnormally high concent force concentration, uh, which uh, can help explain uh, why the cartilage uh, is often diseased uh, earlier on in life in the dysplastic population. So uh, for the treatment of hip dysplasia, uh, first we need to make sure that we have a diagnosis. So for a patient coming in to the clinic with hip pain, we'll get radiographs. And on an AP radiograph, there are multiple measures that we can use to evaluate acetabular coverage. The most common is the lateral center edge angle, which focuses on coverage uh, of the femoral head laterally. Uh, you can also look at the tonus angle, uh, which is uh, uh, reflective of the uh, dome of the acetabulum and is another marker of dysplasia when it's more than 10 degrees. The anterior center edge angle on the bottom left uh, is taken through a false profile radiograph, and that is determined. Um, that, that's where you see the anterior coverage of the acetabulum. It is important to recognize that the acetabulum is truly a three dimensional structure, and the uh, radiographs that we see are two dimensional pictures. So uh, sometimes we need to position the hip in different positions to get a better understanding of uh, how the acetabulum is shaped in three dimensions.
Additionally, there's the fear index. This is back on an AP radiograph where uh, there are lines connecting uh, the uh, epiphysis as well as the uh, sore seal. And if they converge opening out, uh, so opening laterally, that's a sign of dysplasia or positive fear index. If they converge where the angle is opening towards the pubic symphysis, that is a uh, indicator of uh, hip stability or, or uh, uh, not, not dysplastic. There are many indices uh, to evaluate uh, uh, hip dysplasia, a lot of which uh, go beyond the bounds of this talk, uh, but this is a good sl uh, reference slide showing the different ways that uh, radiographically we can uh, look at dysplasia, comparing it to a control population of patients with overcoverage to get reference values um, for that dysplastic population. So once we have identified dysplasia radiographically in a patient, we'll often get advanced imaging if we're considering surgery. Uh, this uh, way it will include an MRI or an uh, MR arthrogram, uh, where we'll evaluate intraarticular structures as well as soft tissue structures, such as the abductor tendons or the iliopsoas tendon. Uh, intraarticularly, we'll be looking uh, for chondrolabral damage, uh, uh, as well as evaluating the integrity of the capsule. Uh, on these patients, because uh, we are considering osteotomies, we'll also get uh, CT scans to have a better three-dimensional understanding of the deformity. Uh, we can evaluate global coverage um, uh, with the dysplastic population. Are they globally undercovered? Is there focal undercoverage anteriorly? Uh, and we can additionally evaluate uh, femoral version uh, through the CT scan. So all that data is gonna be important for preoperative planning. So surgical options for dysplasia, uh, there have been multiple osteotomies that have been proposed in the past. A lot of these stem from the pediatric literature, uh, you know, which were osteotomies to correct dysplasia in a developing pelvis. Uh, there are some salvage osteotomies uh, that were uh, performed uh, for patients that were um, still children, but a little bit older and had a more mature pelvis. Uh, but the workhorse of uh, osteotomy, uh, pelvic osteotomies for adult dysplastic patients is the Bernese periacetabular osteotomy. Uh, this osteotomy invo involves four cuts of the pelvis, uh, and you can see it in the figure. It is uh, outlined by the red triangles. Uh, but the goal is to have a completely free acetabular segment that you are then able to rotate uh, to uh, increase the coverage of the uh, femoral head about the acetabulum. So, a little bit more specifics into the Bernese periacetabular osteotomies. We said that there were four cuts, uh, and this graphic uh, displays the location of the cuts on the three-dimensional pelvis. Uh, again, the goal is a, a freely mobile acetabular fragment, and you can see in the lower right how this can be manipulated to increase that lateral uh, coverage uh, that uh, is, is often deficient in, in the dysplastic population. So looking at the results of this surgery, uh, uh, there have uh, been uh, you know, multiple studies looking at long-term over 10-year results. And uh, uh, we can say confidently with the Bernese PAO, this is one of the few surgeries uh, in orthopedics that can truly change the natural history of the disease. Uh, we, we know that patients that have untreated hip dysplasia uh, go on to have premature arthritis at a very high rate. And we can show, uh, looking at the outcomes here, that the surgery will actually delay or in some cases prevent entirely um, patients going on to need a total hip. Uh, importantly, uh, the timing of this surgery is important. If uh, the radiographic arthritis has already set in, uh, the long-term results of a PAO often end up in arthroplasty. However, the time course um, to getting a uh, total hip uh, may be delayed compared to someone who wasn't treated at all. But the best patient population for this surgery are patients that have no evidence of radiographic arthritis. So it is often in a younger patient cohort. Looking at how, uh, uh, and with longer term outcomes, uh, the uh, radiographs change 
Um, you can see for the Taunus grade zero or Taunus grade one population, uh, only five of them ended up going on to need a total hip uh, at the conclusion of this study. So uh, it just reinforces that uh, earlier intervention before arthritis is set in is critical uh, for the long-term success of the PAO. And uh, and not only timing, but also the accurate location um, or accurate placement of the acetabular fragment is important for success. Uh, not only do surgeons uh, try to get adequate lateral coverage, so improving the lateral center edge angle, but knowing that the acetabulum is a three-dimensional structure, it is important to uh, get uh, uh, appropriate both anterior and posterior coverage. So addressing the deficiency that the patient had coming in, that means each periacetabular osteotomy is going to be unique uh, for the patient getting, getting the surgery. And our goal is to... Uh, identify where they are undercovered and to correct that fragment um, based on their specific location of undercoverage. And if we can do that um, three-dimensionally uh, in, in the, uh, the appropriate way, then the results um, uh, with uh, the long-term results are gonna be much more favorable than for instance, if uh, we uh, the acetabular the version is incorrect at the end of the surgery. So we've uh, spoken about the acetabular side of hip dysplasia, but the femur is often uh, uh, abnormal in the setting of hip dysplasia, and that's because the femur and the acetabulum develop together. So if there are acetabular or abnormalities, there are often going to be femoral abnormalities uh, that present uh, as the patient uh, approaches skeletal maturity. Um, there's one study that found that femoral uh, deformity was present in up to 86% of patients requiring periacetabular osteotomy. And the important thing is not all of these deformities require a surgery. The goal uh, at the end of the case should be a congruent hip joint. So that can be uh, obtained with just an acetabular osteotomy then uh, there, there is uh, no reason to also include a femoral osteotomy. However, if you can't get a congruent joint after the acetabular osteotomy, then a femoral osteotomy would be indicated. There are many different kinds of femoral uh, osteotomies, uh, and they are designed to address the specific deformity a patient might have. So if there is a naturally varus hip with a short neck, uh, then uh, you do a valgus producing osteotomy. Uh, contrarily, if there is a naturally valgus hip, then you would do a varus producing osteotomy. And what you can see from uh, the first slides here, uh, uh, on the lower right, uh, a uh, periastabular osteotomy, osteotomy was performed, but the hip joint remained incongruent. So a femoral osteotomy needed to be completed to uh, increase the congruency of the joint. Anaversion and retroversion, so abnormal uh, femoral version can also be addressed. Uh, many dysplastic patients will have uh, femoral antiversion. Uh, and again, not all of them need a derotational osteotomy. Um, in one series found uh, in the rate of about 5% for requiring a, uh, a derotational osteotomy. And this is something that needs to be discussed with patients and uh, it, it really needs to be elicited clinically, you know, how much are their symptoms are uh, contributed by the dysplasia and how much are from the version abnormalities. A lot of times uh, looking at the patient's foot progression angle uh, or their gait abnormalities uh, can help the clinician in discerning whether a, a derotational osteotomy is truly necessary. Uh, there are additional femoral osteotomies uh, that uh, can be performed for uh, uh, truly complex uh, uh, femoral deformities. These involve surgical hip dislocations uh, and addressing uh, more intra-articular uh, femoral head and neck abnormalities, including the relative femoral like neck, like neck lengthening, which you can see above, and the femoral head reduction osteotomy uh, that you can see below. These are uh, quite rare cases and are, are not commonly performed. Lastly, uh, looking inside the joint, um, there are uh, very often intraarticular abnormalities uh, in dysplastic patients. And a lot of the times it is why that they started to develop symptoms is because they started developing pathology inside the joint. The periacetabular osteotomy is an extraarticular procedure. Uh, so uh, 
you know, to address intraarticular pathology, that would require either a surgical hip dislocation uh, or arthroscopy uh, to uh, evaluate uh, labral and uh, uh, chondral damage in dysplastic patients. Uh, the treatment uh, that we typically perform on almost every patient with uh, dysplasia undergoing a periostabular osteotomy is an arthroscopy, just because the rates of intraarticular pathology are close to 100%. A lot of times, um, as a result of the bony uh, dysplasia, the soft tissues will be hypertrophied to try and uh, uh, account for that instability, and those hypertroph hypertrophied tissues, even though they are larger, they are also... Um, uh, uh, going to be uh, uh, more insufficient and not doing the job that they they need to be doing. So we, there's a frequent incidence of labral tears uh, as well as um, uh, 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 chondral damage as well, all of which can be addressed arthroscopically. Uh, multiple studies have looked at arthroscopy uh, in the setting of hip dysplasia with periacetabular osteotomy. It doesn't increase complication rates and it is a good procedure to address intraarticular pathology uh, that, uh, and as we said, is, is, uh, is quite often present. So going back to clinically, you know, from uh, looking at, uh, we talked about how to treat patients, but, you know, we need to identify them in clinic and, and really determine who should go uh, for uh, a referral. And, you know, a lot of times people will present uh, with dysplasia, they'll have groin pain 97% of the time. They'll have a limp. Uh, it is not always as profound as what you saw in the video, um, but 77% of patients uh, presenting with dysplasia that had an abnormal gait. A lot of times this is from abductor overload or abductor fatigue. Uh, and you can also look at increased range of motion, um, particularly of the unaffected hip. Uh, if uh, the patient has a hip that isn't hurting, uh, patients that are dysplastic will often have increased range of motion uh, compared to um, patients with femoral acetabular impingement. So that could be one um, potential indication that, uh, you know, there might be evidence of dysplasia. Um, but because we're not, you know, when we're evaluating patients in the clinic, you know, we don't have x-ray vision, we can't, you know, tell if they have radiographic dysplasia um, just based on clinical exam. So we're really looking for symptoms of clinical instability. And there are several ways to uh, evaluate this, uh, talking to the patient about uh, what they feel, whether they feel that, you know, when they externally rotate, does their hip feel like it, 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 it uh, subluxes or, or pop, you know, pops or snaps. Um, there's specific uh, tests that you can do in the clinic to uh, evaluate uh, instability. This is apprehension testing. Uh, so uh, there are several apprehension tests that are very good. And it's important to talk with the patient about, you know, where they feel the symptoms and where and whether it's pain or fear. A, a lot of times, uh, you know, a, a patient will have global pain. But when you are doing apprehension testing, uh, you want to localize, you know, when you're pushing posteriorly, are there symptoms anterior? Is that where they feel it? That might be a, uh, that would be a positive uh, uh, anterior apprehension test. Uh, important to also evaluate femoral torsion uh, when considering for uh, derotational osteotomy. Uh, the dial test can help evaluate for capsular laxity and Baton's criteria should be obtained on every patient uh, looking for uh, global ligamentous laxity. So there are many causes of, of clinical instability. Uh, you know, for the osteotomy talk, we focused on uh, osseous dysplasia. But if you see a patient in clinic that, or, or in therapy that, uh, you know, has uh, signs of instability, it may not necessarily be bony. But uh, if uh, uh, identifying patients that are at risk for dysplasia, particularly younger before arthritis is set in, is critical uh, because the appropriate referral uh, can then um, lead to ideal treatment that uh, can uh, change the natural history of their hip and uh, progression to arthritis and down the road. Thank you for your time.